the 7th of May 2002, Celtic and the Celtic fans travelled to Leeds for the Gary Kelly testimonial. On that night, Tomo, Henrik, Sean Maloney and John Harrison hit the back of the net as Celtic ran out 4-1 winners. A full house of over 26,000 fans attended the game. But the real story behind the testimonial was that all the money raised was going to Cancer Centre in Drogheda and also a cancer charity in Leeds. I sat down a few years ago with Gary to chat about the testimonial, his connection with cancer after his sister Mandy died and his career. Welcome to Drogheda, a glorious sunny day in my hometown. Uh, this is an estate called Marion Park, or known to the locals as Mar Park. I come from an estate across the road called Bowlesgrove. They've both produced brilliant sports people, politicians, and also some great business people. There wasn't a lot to do around here back then. There was no computer games, so most people played sports. We had a running club, boxing club, soccer club, GAA clubs. So everybody was basically on the street playing ball, and in particular, the person that lives in this house behind me was always out on the street with a ball. One of the most famous sons of Drada. He's done some brilliant stuff for Drada since his career is finished. Uh, and we're just gonna, gonna knock up now and see if he's gonna come out for a wee chat with us. Well, it's... Gary Kelly. All right, yeah. Will you come out for a wee chat? Yeah, sure enough. Thanks very much for taking time to chat to us. Football club to the right, the shops to the left. I stayed next door for two weeks when my mum was off sunning herself when I was a teenager. In with Fergus and Deirdre, looked after me. But I always remember you with a ball against that wall. Ba-boom, 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 all the time. Was it always football, Gary? Yeah, I know, it was a great day, so it was. Uh, being the youngest of 13. There were so many young lads around the, the streets as well. We just always constantly had a ball. If it wasn't soccer, it was. It was Gaelic, you know, and we'd either play Gates or up into the field and cause havoc, you know, but uh, great days. Um, <clears throat> it led on to a living career from draw the boys onto over the water. Will you come with me for a proper chat? Because it's getting a bit warm here. It's a bit warm for you there. Let's yeah. go for it. Let's, Let's go. go. So, Gary, in from the sunshine of Marion Park, something we, don't, we didn't see too much over the years. Uh, you spoke, we spoke there about you know playing on the streets in Marion Park, and you still you still knock about with the the lads you grew up with. Oh yeah, I think it's a big thing that kept us grounded over the years. Um, like we said, we are in Leeds for seventeen years, and uh, the boys love a weekend away as well. And I think it, they, they turned it into a project themselves. You know, they tried to get over sort of once a month, and as you say, still to this day now, I think we're. we're um, Godfathers to kids and bits and pieces, and we're still all brothers, you know. I mean, we always class ourselves as brothers growing up in the street, all stuck together, and it's no different now, you know. And then, like, obviously, the lads played football uh, with you for, for many years, and then you moved to Home Farm from Draw the Boys, mm -hmm. um, like, and you would have played with a couple of lads then that went on to be um, pro footballers because when you know, when we were letting people know we were doing this little interview, a couple of ex-players that had played over in England and maybe didn't make it and came back and played League of Ireland, yeah. made some comments and that. So, you know, was the step up big, believe in the Boys, or did it give you good ground? Yeah, Draw the Boys was brilliant. We played in a good standard as well. We started in really low leagues and we sort of kept progressing. The likes of Paddy, Bo uh, Paddy O'Boyle. Um, I know there's a couple of Paddy O'Boyles in the town now, right? But uh, his dad was a sergeant. And uh, he used to be banging in 50, 60 goals a year. You know, it was ridiculous for under 12s, 13s, 14s. And then um, we sort of got right up to the A division then, which Home Farm, Belvedere and all them likes were there. But then um, Home Farm sort of came knocking to go to Mill Cup with them. Uh, I think it was the end of June, July, just for a week, just to represent Rotterdam, but play with them. And then after that, I sort of liked it that much. Got to the final, beaten by Spurs, Nicky Bambi and all them. The good side, Sol Campbell. And then when we came back, Paddy Hilliard was the manager of Home Farm. Got in touch with the boys and my dad and that and said, would I like to come up to Home Farm for And signed. So uh, went up there, signed one year with them. We, I think we won the treble, All-Ireland Cup as well. Some great players, PJ O'Connell. 
There was loads and PJ actually came to Leeds with us then at the end of that year, the Leeds scout. There was a few scouts after us, but uh, we went and trialled the city, Man City. Didn't like it, came home after three days. Such a home board. And then uh, went to Leeds then, and then the rest is history. P PJ came. He had a three-year contract, I got a three-year contract. PJ came home after a year and a half with a bad knee injury. So it was lonely, really lonely then for a while, but uh, stuck in then. And uh, just sort of progressed from there. But of course you come from a family of 13, mm -hmm. and youngest of 13, so everyone was looking after you and looking after you. How hard is it when a, a young player, from your experience, moves away from the hometown to a strange city? Yeah, it was really hard. So I was um, like the only one out of the family that sort of ever went away and stayed away, you know. Uh, and I always thought after three years, that's grand. Three years now, I'll be home after three years. So it's not too bad, you know. But uh, every sort of two years, either Howard Wilkinson, whoever the manager was, put another three years on to it. And then it was another year, it was nearly like a jail sentence at one time. Said, I'll never go home to see me, mum and dad. But uh, yeah, it was really hard. Uh, where we were was, was in Beeston. It was around 10 minute walk down to Ellen Road. Rough area, lovely people, but uh, I think it was tough, it was strange. One day we, we always knew the house had been watched or something like that, and we were all in digs. And we walked down to Ellen Road. The next time we come back and seen the front door pushed in, I went, oh my God, it's after been broken into. And there was around 10 different rooms in there. We were on the second last floor. Every other room was ransacked, but mine and PJ's. Every other room, tellies, everything gone, and there was nothing touched in our room. So we said, someone's keeping an eye on us, but we never knew who it was, you know? <laughs> it was a strange story, but I, I, the cops even questioned us. We thought it was an inside job. We, went, we were a training, you know, but the whole house was ransacked, but our room, so someone was mine. Someone, someone was looking at us. Someone was us for 17 years, yeah. But, but you, PJ came home, he didn't make it, um, <clears throat> and as a lot of kids don't, and uh, that can be hard to come back. Um, I remember speaking to John Carolyn, who played with Liverpool Reserves, and, didn't, and when John came back to play League of Ireland, he said he had an attitude of, oh, I've made it now when he got there. Mm. Was there a bit of that with you, or did you have to walk hard to, you know, to... Because you moved fairly quick into the, the first team, like... Yeah, it was strange. I think uh, when you signed for a big club, when Leeds was a big club as well, it was the year that they won the title as well. So, uh, starting off, it was tough, you know. Like, you're after signing for Leeds United and the championship of the... It was the top league at the time. And uh, you, you, you always think, it's, is it a dream or is it whatever? You didn't really know, you know. It was weird. You'd go onto the football pitch and just think it was just a normal game of ball. But you'd forget that you were playing for Leeds United, one of the biggest clubs in the country, never mind Europe, probably, you know. And then uh, as it progressed, then we started getting better and better. Big names were coming in. We were starting to get noticed and noticed. More noticed as a club, as a team, players. Uh, but it was tough, but a lot of kids that did go over and come home really early still thought he made it and they still think they made it, you know what I mean, because they signed three years and all that. A lot of them had to come home with injuries and bits and pieces, but uh, it is, uh, it's, it's a weird one. I never sort of thought you, you made it, because I think if you think you made it at an early age then, it's gone to your head and you just, you won't focus on what you went over there to do and, do you know what I mean, so big games and weddings and Saturdays, so you just have to, Focus out of all the attention and all the, the the media stuff and bits and pieces, and just concentrate on your ball and don't mind what's off the pitch. And you're so you've gone over, you've broken into the force team. It's full of you know Gordon Strachan, Gary McAllister. These are all household names, mm -hmm. international players. You're a kid, um, like when you made your debut in the season that you won won the league, the yeah. last year of the old force division, you know, and then this team progressed onto the Champions League, a semi final, you know. Did you ever envisage that, you know, it would take, it would go so quick that you would go from youth player to yeah. first team? No, definitely not. Uh, a lot of luck as well, you know what I mean? Like, if, if the two of us went over centre centre forwards, we sent PJ from home farm. PJ was miles better, bigger, stronger player. Used to be in a way, he went in all sorts of trials, bits and pieces. And I was the lad from Dorada, big family, mad to go home. A bit sheepish, small, skinny. Uh, but um, it was just sort of look at the drawer, you know, it happened to just, PJ got injured in the youth team and then I was uh, brought on sort of, I think it was Forrest away the year they won the title for striking on the wing and then sort of from the wing to up front or whatever like that. But it was more so on the wing and uh, it sort of pro progressed from there. And then uh, the likes of Mel Sterling got injured. I think the second year then 
Mel Sterling got injured, I didn't show the face at all in the force team. Uh, and it was until, as I said, Mel got injured and then Howard Wilkins just had a brainwave to just say, I'm going to put you at right back for the upcoming season and see how you do. Played us there for pre-season. I think we had around 10 games and played us in them all. And then uh, the rest was sort of history after that. He just stuck with us at right back, you know, and then happened to get into the Irish squad as well, you know. Yeah, the Irish squad guys, uh, like, you know, your dad and your brothers, the family, like, uh, and your mates and that, even at, like, underage level, mm. it, must, it must be so proud to oh, yeah. pull that green jersey on for the first time. Oh, to be called in as well, you know, like, you, you start playing well. The, uh, what was it, 1994 season for Leeds, and then you start hearing that uh, Jack Charlton's coming to watch at Ellen Road, and you go, oh, my God, I'm going to get into the squad, you know what I mean? And then finally, we, you get into the squad, Jack pulls you after the game, and says, I'm thinking of bringing you into the squad on Sunday. And then, you're happy enough in the squad, and then there's a World Cup coming up, and you go, hardly, am I going to be on this aeroplane going to America, you know? But done well. It was the same time as Jason, and Jason McAteer and Phil Babb come in, and uh, they done really well. Uh, in the Irish, for the, for the friendly against Russia up in the old lands down. And we done well and we stayed in all the games and we got great results. So we brought the three of us, so there was three young lads sort of breaking into the, the old head of Jack's guard, you know what I mean? So uh, that was great days that he were and we just happened to get to a World Cup as well, you know. But that was very hard with Jack because Jack was very loyal to the older players, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I don't want to jump forward too far, but when Mick took the team over, there wasn't that many players left. But if you go back, I remember speaking to um, Ray Houghton, yeah, and uh, he was he was saying like that um, he didn't think he was going to go to America, mm -hmm. but Jack had faith in him, and he yeah. and then he played in America, you know, because he said he wasn't really, yeah, you know, a lot of people didn't think he'd play, and so Jack was very loyal. So to bring you in at such a, a young age, maybe, yeah. and then I suppose you became. You know, the, the, yeah. cover, the cover story, you know, the three amigos. Yeah, Jack was loyal to all the old guard, all right. So I think everyone in the country from Italian 90 to 94, that squad, like the household names, yeah. you know, you're going from Bonner to Chris Uton, Chris Houghton, you know, yeah. uh, right through to Stapleton and, and the whole lot, and the rest is history, you know. And then, so we brought the, the younger field into a, into the old brigade. It was tough to break in and all right, but we were young characters and the... They talked to us straight away, you know, you know, we weren't sort of shy going in, like if there was a night out, we'd be gone with them, you know what I mean? We'd have no say, but uh, yeah, Jack thought he'd stick to the old brigade, but uh, he sort of freshened it up a little bit and we were sort of doing so well with our clubs, and we were lucky. We just got our heads down and we were kids and we got on well with uh, the Irish lads and uh, we were playing sort of good ball with our clubs. I think uh, Jason was at Bolton, was it? It was before the two boys went to Liverpool, wasn't it? Phil, Phil was at Coventry. Coventry. And Jason was at Bolton, and I was at Leeds, and we were all sort of doing all right, coming good, and we were Irish lads. As you're saying, the boys were getting a little bit older now, and he was probably looking for fresh legs as well, so we just sort of broke into the team, and the rest goes from there. It was great days, you know? It was, it was kind of surreal for, like, you know, local people from Drada. Um, <coughs> I remember sitting in a pub for one of the games. I think it was, I think it was the Norway game. And uh, you're watching the game, and you know, there's people, there's little stories, be you know, Gary Kelly, like you know, people, yeah. are, and a couple of our mates are in the pub that you grew up with, and uh, so you know, everyone's going, and there's little stories going around, and I turned around to my mates and I said, well, like, the last time I seen Gary Kelly, he was flying by me on a bicycle in Ballsgrove, yeah, and the next time, I'd I'd hear an angle, you know, and he gave me a show, he drove by on a bike, and next to hearing the local paper, you know, yeah. signing for Leeds, and then. But to progress then onto the international stage, and and I'm going to be honest, when you were going to that World Cup, I didn't think you'd play in it because no. Dennis Irwin was yeah. the main man at Man United, and I thought you know he's going there for the experience. Yeah. But then of course, yeah. you know, I didn't care either. I was on the plane. I was going to the World Cup, and I was going, Jesus, you know, I'm going with my club. I'm going with my country, just to be part of it. And then Dennis picked up uh, yellow against Italy, and then a yellow against Mexico. I think it was. So that meant he was out, so I was going, I have a chance to get in here, you know, so you just go, at least I'm after playing one, you just think in your head, like, he's going to put Dennis back in, at least we're going to play one game for Ireland, you know, so we played against Norway, we got the point that we deserved at the Giant Stadium, and uh, then the decision had to come, does he put Dennis back in, or does he put, or do I stay in, you know, so he, he picked, more or less picked the same team and kept us in there, so uh, very grateful to Jack and all that, but Dennis was, 
he's up there with one of the best left back and right backs. He can play either side, you know. Um, to Grafey and then the utmost respect from you know Dennis, great man. I wouldn't be knocking yourself, now, you know. You may have I know, yourself. yeah, no. I'd, I'd always class up my career as a bit of Excellent. bit of luck. There's Kelly. always better players. And Three in the center as he can pull it back across. To go through six or seven managers and he still stuck with you. I know you had to do something right, but I'd always go. You have to be blessed as well, you know. Do you mean modesty showing through that? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Even trying, how long I've been trying to get you to sit down and be interviewed, you know? Yeah. And just because, like, you're not really the typical ex footballer, you know, that's on no. the circuit or, you know, working with the media. Yeah. It's just the quiet life. Um, but, so you're at Leeds, everything's going brilliant for you, you know, and, like, in the end, you played over 500 games for Leeds and captained the team. And Leeds was good to you, Gary. It was a city yeah. that was good to you. You, you, you know. It put a roof over your family's yeah, head. Yeah, I'd always say that. You know, I'd always class these as, you know, I'd, I'd say to the kids, you know, see them feet there, and the little one would go, yeah, they're old and rusty. I said, but them old and rusty feet, that's clothes in your back and the roof over your fucking head, you know. But they'd all giggling, and the eldest would go, oh, here he goes again, you know, another half an hour of this crap. But it's typical working class yeah. values, and well, you, yeah. you brought it up for your family. Like I tried to get them to think that, they'd appreciate it, it just wasn't gifted, you know, the dad and mum had to walk hard for it, and even those as well, it was great to come home, they keep it grounded as well, because with Laura and Lee really early, myself and Jules, 22, 23, and then it's only when we come home there, we have Casey now. We're home 11 years, and we have Casey 8, you know, so it's great. Myself and Jules are still young, you know, 40, 44, um, you know, we've a 22 year old, 20 year old, and an 8 year old, and it's great because we wanted that to have that sort of not parents that was sort of older, I'm not knocking parents that's older, but just have their fun loving experience and you know, life with them, you know, yeah, and then and it, make sure they were grounded, if they which, were grounded which is very hard, I'd say, because oh, yeah, you know, the, you know, the dad's famous, yeah, you know, and he's not walking down the mine, no, it doesn't walk like that, so they more or less they've uh, half a ball scrub in them and they've half a Marion Park in them, two great, and a lot of draw it, so. No, we never let them go like that, no. I'm going to just go back to Marion Park and, and to Ballsgrove. Obviously, your wife, Julianne, from your childhood sweetheart, I suppose. Mm -hmm. and, but like most, most, they say, you know, every, every good man has a great woman behind him. But you have eight great women behind you. Yeah, sisters, Six sisters. my mum and Jules, as you say, yeah. That was great, yeah. Like, That's, even a lot of people that say that, you know, where, where did you get it from, you know? Like every one of them, mine, I was the youngest in the family, I was the baby of the household. I think Monday I was with, I was with Jean, Wednesday I was with Pamela, or Mandy, or Yvonne, or Pamela, you name it, or Marie. So uh, one day I think they all had me, and then it was the lads the weekends when mum and dad go out and bring him to the football. So I'd always go a bit of them all, so that's why sometimes I get that twitch that I'm not mentally sane, you know, because they're, <laughs> <laughs> they're all mad things, you know. They're all mad. I've chatted to your sisters, and even, even when we were shooting up in Marion Park, like, and some of the stories they told me when you left, like, we can't put them on camera, mm. but, you know, we might make it serious about it. They're all bonkers, yeah. But, like, everything is going well for you. You're in Leeds, you know, you're living the dream. You're Irish international, and then you drop with the news. Of Mandy, mm. that she's got cancer. Like, yeah, you know, how does that affect? Yeah, it was tough, really hard. And like Mandy, never, uh, Mandy and Deck were brilliant to us. You know, everyone was brilliant to us, even Drada, and never mind the family. But Mandy and Deck, Deck was sort of the advisor, and Mandy's we said, so really close to all my family. But it was just sort of a connection there that we were really, really joint. You know, at the hips, and uh, she was at me first Premier League appearance at Main Road, Man City, and. She'd be there wearing a Leeds jersey with Kelly 22 in the back. Oh, she was just great, you know. And then you get the news over the phone and you go, this can't be real. You go, you know, she'll get rid of this. I've done it many times. We got the phone call to say that. No, we got the all clear, you know. And then probably a month later, no spark again. And I think it was worse when I came back then. I was going, Jesus, what's going down here? Because you never think it's going to happen to your own family. And then when it happens to someone, like Mandy just destroyed us, you know. But uh, even going a little bit, when Mandy passed away then, and my me dad saying, I was five days home after the funeral. And he more or less said to us, you know, when you come back, he says, so what's happened with Jimmy, man? You used to call me your man. And he says, you're going to go back or what? And I said, it was no humour. I just thought that was it then, you know, throw the, throw the hat at Dad was the bad cop, my mum was the good cop, you know. Come on, you have to go back, you have kids. And, you know, I went back straight away, sort of immune to everything, just... Doing my training, uh, going back to the house, just 
living in a shell. George Graham called us in and he says, this team won't do anything without you without, for the rest of the season. Unless you get your finger out, I'm going to make you captain of the club uh, and drive them players on because they're all heartbroken looking at you. So he made us captain of the club, Leeds United. And I said, geez, I can't let down the boys as well, you know, because I was just, just in a bad place. And uh, off we went, we got into Europe. And then the story sort of folded on from then. We were getting Europe each, each year and then we start creeping into Champions Leagues and all that, on and off being captain. So I remember George Graham saying that you've you got to lift them players because they're fed up looking at you just being so down. Didn't they think it happened to our family, but it just shows it takes no prisoners, can't it? Well, there's, there's many, uh, you know, I'm lucky enough, there's a couple of statues to great sporting people from Droyal in the town. And the stat every football ground I go to, you know, you'll, you'll see a statue. There's one outside Leeds, there's a couple outside Celtic. But I suppose, you know, the greatest statue that can be ever built to you has already been built. Mm. And that's the Gary Kelly Cancer Centre. And, like, it's, you know, speaking from people who have been through it, it's, you know, it, it's, it's your legacy, you know. Even mm. though, you know, over 500 games for Leeds, international player and that, you know, it's funny that your legacy is outside football. And I remember um, when the testimony came about, because it was against my club, yeah. Celtic, you know, and I, I just remember how proud, you know, to be in the stadium that yeah. night. And not because we beat just 4-1, right? Yeah, hammered. But because it was like such a, because we knew what, we knew what was right, we were raising funds for. And the town of Drada, like, the spirit before the game, I remember your brother Bill coming into McHugh's and he was selling non-attendance tickets. And everybody was buying them, you know. Mm -hmm. It was enough for debate, you know. The support was there. Not really sure what was happening. And then obviously, you know, the game was it was, it was a brilliant occasion. Yeah, you know? it was great everyone had stories, like but from we arrived in Leeds till we left, it was like walking down West Street. Yeah. You know, that was the love that people had for you and what you were doing. Yeah. And the, everyone was so proud. Um and I always speak to people about it in Glasgow, you know, and they were down at the game. And like, you know, I suppose if it wasn't for that game, you know, Gary Kelly wouldn't yeah. be on the radar. It was because that, you know, the couple of quid we paid for a ticket or the programme we bought that day, we, it was coming back, you know, and half of the money stayed in Leeds, which I think is, because Leeds was good to you. Oh, yeah, yeah, there was money there for the um, Leeds cancer. I think it's youth trust or something like that, because it was important as well, because half my life was in Leeds, you know what I mean? Mm. But um, we sort of just wanted to sort of, Say that thanks to Mandy as well, and just so make sure that she wasn't forgotten. And still, you know, the girls are, you know, the girls are wounded doing half marathons, ladies marathons, full marathons, but they don't care, you know what I mean? They, they can see a light there now that they say, we can get to the end of this, we can fight this. And as you say, the cancer's up there, and it's just showing that it can be done if a uh, community all come together. And uh, they got two clubs that don't really get on great leads and, and um, Celtic to come together and have a great night and get 20, 21,000 euro, 29,000, wherever it was. And then, as you say, the cancer has still gone strong. You'd love to say that, and people ask you, how's it going up there? You'd love to say, yeah, there was no one in this week, but it's not like that, it's not that game, you know, it's it's packed through the rafters, you know, we nearly do it, another one up in Dundalk and all that. I think that's in the future now, we're aiming to get another one on the land or somewhere even closer, so a lot of sick people don't have to travel to it, but um, it's there at the moment, as you say. I miss her shocking and all that, but her legacy will never be forgot. And uh, she'll still be my sister. I still count that I've taught you, and, you know, brothers and sisters or whatever like that. But she's not gone anywhere. It's only a while before we get up to see her, you know. And guys, this is, like you said, community. And community is, if any, it's it from your street in Marion Park to the town of Draw, to county, the county loud and county Mead. The Gary Kelly Centre kind of epitomised community because the mm. tradesmen all came together, gave Everything. their time up. Yeah, top you to know, bottom. people raised money, and it's completely privately funded, isn't it? Yeah, Do you know, and which is which is amazing, like you know. Yeah, people know they're diagnosed with cancer and all that, and they don't go home and tell their children, they don't tell their husbands or their sisters and all that, but they go into their house and they'll open up to the trustees up there. So it's uh, it's their getaway, but it's there for absolutely anyone, you know. I'd be telling them, man, just go and see Anne Tracy. Anne Tracy and the committee up there, they're just brilliant, you know. Deck Weldon, the chairperson, and everything, you know, Barbara Bourne. You can go on, there's loads of them all over the years. Phil that's left. Uh, they've all put in the map, but as you say, the, tr the town just pulled together. The area just pulled together. So, as I'm saying, like, with the flag coming up and all that, how we got that two years in a row, this, this place, if it puts its mind together, it can do anything, you know yeah. what I mean? 
And the people are grey. Like some, some, a lot of people say, oh, draw this full of grudges and all that. No, it's not. It's the proof's in the pudding. Look, they've, they've closed the gate there, the Lanzas Gate. They've, we've a cancer house now because they all pulled together. It just needs to be pushed in the right direction. And, and if we all stick together, we can get that. And hopefully we will. Mm. Just, just before we wrap up, I just want to talk about Drada. Like, a lot of players, when they go away, you know, a lot of celebrity-style people, they don't come back, you know, they, they live... Was Drada always on the horizon when you were oh, talking? Oh, yeah. As I said, the first, first contract got was three years. I was going, well, 16, at least I'll be home when I'm 19, you know. I never thought, you know. I mean, I could always say, I played for Leeds for three years. I was over there in Troy. He was a great player, you know. And then uh, over and over. But I remember my last contract, David O'Leary and Peter Ridgedale gave us a six-year contract. And I just remember saying to um, Dick Weldon and Jules and my mum and dad, and I said, after this, that will be 17 years at one club. A few opportunities go somewhere else. I said, that's it, then. I want to have a bit of a life with my mum and dad and Jules's mum and dad and sort of come home and appreciate um, Drada in Ireland and all that, coming home after being away for so long and bring up my kids over here, you know what I mean? So now we're home, we're home 11 years and it's great. Uh, it's great you can walk in and have an arm point. Everyone's sick looking at us now, they not go. <laughs> There's no no you know, uh, Get us a jersey or can you get us a ticket or whatever like that. Now it's, uh, oh jeez, he's in the pub again, is he? <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's, it's just one of those, you're sort of part of the function now, and that's the way I liked it, and that's what it was like at Leeds as well. They're going, Kelly's right back today, and we said, well, it's part of the function there, so uh, it's great now being at home now, they're, just, they're used to seeing us now, so they're, they're paying no heed us, so it was great. <laughs> and Guys, it's been an absolute pleasure, right? Um, I don't think this is the end of the conversation, because I think there's other stuff to talk about as the years go by, and down the road. And I'd just like to say thank you very much for chatting oh, well, to us. Thanks for having thank us. You. All Celtic Soul podcasts are free to listeners and you can listen to them across all platforms or on our YouTube channel, Celtic Fanzine TV. If you would like to support what we're doing as we don't put anything behind a paywall or Patreon, you can do so by visiting CelticFanzine.com where you can become a member, subscribe, buy or donate for the price of a pint or a coffee.